Are you sitting uncomfortably? Here's how games can scare us in ways that movies never could. Hello, this is Matt, and today we're going to look at some of the ways video games play with our brains to keep us on edge. Many of the tricks are traditional storytelling devices, which use things like setting, character and atmosphere to keep us engaged. But unlike most movies or books, games have a toolbox of interactive tricks they can use to keep our palms sweating. Much of the stuff we'll talk about comes from an article by Chris Pruitt, developer of a game called Dead Secret. The link to the article is in the description below, but it's worth pointing out now that these tricks don't just apply to horror games. You'll see many of the same methods used in action RPGs like Dark Souls or adventure games like Tomb Raider. And if you've got any examples of games that have used clever tricks to keep you engaged, please do pop them in the comments below. Before we get started, we need to establish what we mean by tension. I'm not talking about tension caused by a game being frustrating or experiencing tilt in a competitive game, although there are elements of both of these things that can inform the tricks used in this video. Instead, I'm talking about the deliberate, measured tension you often find in horror games. One of the most effective things games can do to scare you is make you forget about the outside world. And one of the easiest ways they can do this is with patterns. By encouraging you to do the same thing repeatedly, games can make you lose your sense of where you are, which means when the shocks finally arrive, they hit you even harder. Iteration is a really effective way of doing this, and perhaps the game that does it best is, of course, PT. Yes, I'm still sad about it as well. The motif of the repeating corridor draws you in and almost hypnotizes you, and when it breaks its own pattern, the results are terrifying. Thomas Grip, the developer of Amnesia The Dark Descent, calls this the sense of presence. In other words, the feeling of actually being in the game world. But it actually goes deeper than that. Many games teach us to recognize patterns. We look for them in boss fights, level design, NPC behavior, and so on. And when we do find them, it's comforting. You know what's coming next. Unless, of course, you don't. When a game breaks those rules, it reminds us that we're not in control, and that is an inherently frightening thing. So games that want to build tension effectively have to strike a delicate balance. Change the rules too often and games can become frustrating instead of scary. But by establishing a set of rules and telling us that yes, those rules can be broken, our brains become constantly on edge. Enrich that with the sense of presence that comes from feeling like we're in the game world and you have the foundation for a very effective horror game. Games have to be dynamic if they're going to build tension. This means that we have to have quiet moments as well as dramatic ones. If they just threw relentless waves of enemies at us, then every game would be Doom. And while there's obviously nothing wrong with Doom, it's not exactly what we want here. Tension in games works best when our brains have time to recover, and this is why jump scares work so well. It's not just that the initial pop startles us, but more that we become aware of the threat of future jump scares, which puts us on edge. Constant jump scares would tire us out, and they'd soon lose their effectiveness. But as a way of establishing slow burn tension, there's really nothing better. As Pruitt points out, one of the most effective uses of a jump scare comes from Resident Evil. The dogs smashing through the window tell us that we can't trust this world and that apparently safe areas can still pose a threat. But it's even cleverer in the remake. Instead of placing the jump scare in the same section, the dogs don't attack you until much later in the game. It's the ultimate knowing example of how developers can build tension by using your own knowledge against you. Because subconsciously, your brain now knows that you can't trust anything about this game and that puts you on edge. It's a masterful way of keeping you on edge that's somehow even worse if you played the original. So thanks, Capcom. All right, so on the face of it, making a game harder doesn't seem like the most cerebral way to increase levels of tension. But one of the challenges all horror games face is making your experience difficult without it becoming frustrating. Because if you're angry at a game, the chances are you're no longer scared. Pruitt mentions two ways games can do this. He calls the first one meaningful failure. This, as you probably guessed, is the idea that players need a tangible penalty for failing in a game. And, as we'll explore now, there's more than one way to do this. Some games, such as Alien Isolation, implement meaningful failure by rationing your save points. 
You know if you fail, you're going to have to do some serious backtracking to get back to where you were. You're losing time and progress whenever you die, which makes you more cautious, which, in turn, makes things more tense. Others, such as Five Nights at Freddy's and Slender, use the classic jump scares we mentioned before, although it's slightly different to the examples we used in the previous entry because the threat of an unpleasant shock directly relates to your competence. If you fail, you get a jump scare. So you might understand the rules at work here, but it builds tension by making you want to avoid the consequences. Another thing that many tense games use is misattribution. This is a slightly complicated psychological concept, but the basic idea is that if a game elicits the same physical response as being scared, such as sweating or increased heart rate, you're more likely to experience real fear. Essentially, your brain mistakes your physical response for fear and actually makes you afraid in real life. It's the same concept as adopting power poses to feel more confident, but just in reverse. Pruitt mentions the example of horror games using stilted or unfamiliar systems to take away your sense of control, which increases the difficulty and makes you feel more vulnerable. By doing so, these games subtly elevate your physiological state, triggering the effect we just mentioned. If you compare a classic Resident Evil game or Dead Space, for example, with something like Destiny where your character is amazingly mobile, you can instantly see and feel the difference. Swap those systems around, and the enemies in the horror games would suddenly become laughably ineffectual. We might not always know it, but when we play games, we're usually following a set of rules. As I mentioned earlier, we actively look for patterns so we can beat the game, because that's reassuring to us. So when a game goes out of its way to hide those rules, our brains really don't like it. In his article, Pruitt explains that by obscuring those rules, games can force players to think contextually rather than systemically. This means we stop looking at games as a series of numbers and rules, and instead see them as experiences. There are good examples of this in our old friend Resident Evil. Instead of being a series of numbers or a linear bar, your health is represented by the threateningly vague, fine, caution, danger. But the game goes even further, manifesting your character damage by the actual animation itself. Take enough damage and you'll begin to shuffle about like one of the undead. There's always a danger of falling into the controllable helplessness trap with this, which is something Louise has talked about in another video, and the link for that is in the description below. And it's not just our health bar that matters. Horror games add tension by doing the very same thing with our enemies. The famous Silent Hill fight with Pyramid Head will be much less effective if you saw his life bar depleted every time you took a shot at him. He'd instantly stop being the horrifying manifestation of James's repressed desires and instead become a series of numbers and equations, which isn't scary at all unless you really hate arithmetic. There are some rules in horror games, however, that remain sacred. The sanctity of the Resident Evil safe room, for example, is something that the games rarely, if ever, transgress. But this links back to our earlier point about jump scares. The game has told us that it can't be trusted, so even when you're in a safe room, that uneasy music makes you feel that maybe, just maybe, you're not as safe as you'd like. And the last thing we're going to talk about is character design. Consider your favourite characters from horror games. They're often capable, but rarely aspirational. Nobody would go out of their way to be like James Sunderland, partly because he suffered significant psychological trauma, and partly because you're probably already a little bit like James Sunderland, because he's just a normal guy. Even Special Agent Leon Kennedy from Resident Evil 4, a man who can suplex infected Ganados, rarely comes off like a superhero. For players to feel fear or tension, they have to feel scared for their avatars. The characters you play need to seem like they're actually in danger. And Pruitt points out that this doesn't necessarily mean that a character has to appear weak. Leon Kennedy, as I mentioned, can leap out of windows and chuck grenades, but he's still surrounded by things that can easily kill him. Yes, he's capable of dealing with hordes of monstrous villagers, but put him on a lake with a massive man-eating fish and you might as well be controlling a helpless kitten. When you begin to examine other horror games, you see this correlation everywhere. The more powerful the protagonist, the more dangerous the enemies have to be to make you care. The elite forces of Resident Evil, for example, if indeed you can call them that, end up dealing with genetically engineered killing machines. 
Meanwhile, the more ordinary characters of Silent Hill face haunted mannequins and ghost babies. And in perhaps the most extreme example of them all, the schoolgirl protagonist of Clock Tower has to worry about a man with some big scissors. How terrifying. Conversely, when horror games give us overtly heroic characters, such as the sentient wardrobe Chris Redfield in Resident Evil 5, it's much harder to feel afraid. Chris looks and acts like a guy that would take all of this stuff in his stride. And if the avatar of the game isn't scared, then why on earth should we be? And there you have it, five ways that games use a combination of unique methods to keep us on edge. Now there are obviously loads of other things games do to scare us. Sound design is particularly important, and that's something we've covered in depth in a previous video, but please do let us know what tricks games use that work on you, or if horror games just don't scare you at all. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please give this video a like if you can't walk past a mansion window without thinking of zombie dogs, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and features.